So, this next meditation is about steadying the mind. Steadiness of mind is a great resource in daily life, helping us focus at work, at home, in sports and other recreation, and all kinds of other activities. And it is a foundational skill in any kind of inner exploration or contemplative practice, including the meditations in this program. Now, in this meditation, we will explore many ways to build up your concentration and focus and strengthen the neural circuitry that supports these. But first, because the attention machinery of your brain is so important, I'm going to give a longer introduction than usual to this meditation. So here's the basic problem. The mind is a great servant, but a terrible master. That voice in the back of the head that always seems to be running, worrying about this, planning that, building up an irritated case about somebody, fantasizing about a TV show, obsessing about some conversation with a relative, whatever. That voice in the back of the head tends to build up a negative story or picture about the world and, most importantly, yourself. That's bad enough, but that storyline gradually sinks into your mind, since neurons that fire together wire together, and thus your brain, conditioning both of these over time to downplay the good expect the bad, and become sensitized and overly reactive to the inevitable ups and downs of life. Second, there's the problem of being unable to keep your attention where you want it, to focus or concentrate. For example, how easy really is it to keep your attention fully on a conversation with your mate, or on an afternoon meeting at work, or maybe something important but kind of boring that you've got to read, or in meditation on the feeling of the breath? Breath after breath after breath. Imagine how your day would go and feel if you could simply keep your attention wherever you wanted it all day long. Monkey mind, the scrabbling after the next thought banana, skittering away from where you really wanted to rest, is the antithesis of the supple and malleable, shapeable tool that the mind can be when properly trained and focused. This is so important that William James, the father of psychology in America, about a hundred years ago wrote that the education of attention would be an education par excellence. Your attention is like the window through which the world enters your mind, consequently shaping and changing your brain. Now all that said, now we come to the challenge. It's called monkey mind for a reason. This sort of jumpy, distractible attention is what helped our monkey ancestors, and their great-grandparents too, to survive in the wild where danger lurked everywhere, and a nervous scanning helped animals to survive. Now to understand how monkey mind works in your brain, so that you can get more control over it in order to focus and strengthen your attention, let's start with some background information about how attention works in general. So fundamentally, to help an animal to survive, especially a very complicated animal like a human being, the brain has to be able to do two things. First, it has to keep important information in the field of awareness, like a suspicious movement in the grass of the African savanna, or a new phone number before you get a chance to write it down, or maybe an insight you just had about something. That field of awareness is sometimes called the global workspace of consciousness, or in plainer English, the mental chalkboard. Now second, your brain has to be able to update the field of awareness, the chalkboard, with new and important information. And since the size of the chalkboard is limited, that often means scooting old information off the board to make way for the new stuff. Out with the old, in with the new. If the brain cannot hold information steady in the mind well enough on the chalkboard, that's a problem. But it's also a problem if the brain can't let go of old information, getting it off the chalkboard, to bring in important new things. The first kind of problem, can't hold information steady, by the way, is associated with attentional issues, such as ADD. The second kind of problem, can't get old stuff off the board, is associated with obsessions and compulsions. So, the brain has to perform a balancing act between a steady focus and a flexible one. It has to be able to stay zeroed in on the bananas in this tree while remaining open to the twigs breaking sounds of a leopard nearby. Now, understanding how your brain does this balancing act gives you a great way 
to steady your mind. Here's how it works. For the contents of that chalkboard to remain stable, there seems to be a sort of neurological gate that separates working memory, which is the chalkboard, from all the other information endlessly coursing through the brain. And when you're staying focused on just one object of attention, that gate is closed. Then, when your attention shifts to a new focus, let's say a new thought or the sound of a bird outside or something important you've got to get ready for, this means neurologically that the gate opens, allowing new information in to update working memory. And then the gate closes behind it, keeping other informational intruders outside of awareness and off the chalkboard. So, the big question is, what opens and closes that gate? That's at the crux of how to steady the mind. Now, there's good evidence that what keeps the gate closed is a steady transmission of a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And what opens the gate is a surge, a spike of dopamine. So, if you're already experiencing lots of dopamine, then it is harder to get a spike since the neurons are already close to or at their peak firing rate capacity. They are already at the ceiling and can't go any higher. So, how to have high, steady transmissions of dopamine? Here's the answer. Whenever you are experiencing anything rewarding, that means there are high flows of dopamine. And one of the most rewarding experiences of all is sustained positive emotion. The happier, more joyful, more loving, the better. And that means, of course, steady currents of dopamine. Therefore, in a physical, neurological way, if you are feeling caring or contentment or peace or even more intense feelings of joy or even bliss, those feelings will all help steady your mind. In other words, whether you are just trying to keep your eyes open in an afternoon meeting or helping yourself settle into deep states of meditative absorption, happiness is skillful means. And that's good to know because there's another challenge to steadying your mind. The built-in hunger of the brain for stimulation, which helped keep our ancient ancestors vigilant and alive in the threat and opportunity filled world that they evolved in. Here's how a part of your brain produces that craving for stimulation. And understanding how it does so tells you how to control it better for greater steadiness of mind. A part of the brain called the basal ganglia sits at the junction of the modern cerebral cortex and the reptilian brain we inherited from our really, really ancient ancestors. The basal ganglia, a small cluster of neural nodes about the size of the first joint of your little finger, registers the flow of stimulation coming in through your senses and from your mind itself. When that flow of stimulation drops below certain thresholds, then the basal ganglia send out signals encouraging the organism to seek more stimulation by exploring its world or thinking about something different. And as long as this flow of stimulation is above certain thresholds, the basal ganglia does not trigger activity and restlessness. So, to sum up, to help you survive, your brain has three natural inclinations that, unfortunately, undermine steadiness of attention. These are, one, fatiguing with concentration on one stimulus, such as, let's say, the sensations of breathing or uh, a math problem a child is doing in school. Second, having porous filters for new and distracting stimuli, kind of like not having uh, curtains, really, uh, for windows when the sun is shining really brightly or not being able to keep out distracting sounds. And third, being generally hungry for new stimuli. Now, it's important to keep in mind that there is a wide range of individual variation in these inclinations, which are a key part of a person's basic temperament. For example, some people can be both easily flooded by new inputs, meaning they have very porous filters, as well as hungry for stimulation. And there's probably at least one child like this in most first grade classrooms. 
the kind of kid who can't stand the tags on his or her T-shirts, or in our own case, our son uh, couldn't wear his socks right side in because the weird nubby things on the inside of his socks really bugged him. So he actually wore his socks inside out for a really long time. But a child who is also moving around a lot to keep looking for the next exciting thing. In other words, a child who, on the one hand, is overly affected by incoming information, but also really hungry and looking for things that are new. Now, of course, by the way, these inclinations can also be very affected by other factors, such as life experiences, traumas, illness, motivation, fatigue, low blood sugar, anxiety, or even depression. Even video games, for example, are an unfortunately powerful education in distractibility and stimulation hunger. These other factors are worth considering and perhaps speaking with a physician or therapist about if steadiness of mind is a real challenge for you or a child you care for. So, in terms of individual variation, I really suggest that you be straightforward, realistic, and compassionate with yourself about your own inclinations. Do you tend to get tired quickly when you have to concentrate? Do new sounds or sights or thoughts or feelings or desires seem to grab hold of your mind really easily? Do you get bored quickly and need new stimulation? Whatever your inclinations are, they call for three things. Compassion for yourself, individual adaptations in your approaches towards steadiness of mind, whether in daily life or meditation, and third, training. And that's what we're about to do with the next meditation in which you will explore and strengthen the neural pathways of four fundamental abilities. First, the overall strength of intention to focus on one object. Second, sustaining attention on one stimulus, kind of gluing your mind to it. Third, filtering out distractions. And fourth, staying satisfied with one stimulus so you don't have to keep looking for other ones. And that will be an education par excellence. So now let's do the meditation itself, in which we'll work through each one of these four strengths. Inside of each one, we'll do a few different methods that you can get an experience of and take about half a minute for each one, kind of a sampling of tools in the toolbox. And of course, you can put this program on pause at any point if you want to take more time with any one method, or you can skip ahead to the next one you'll naturally find that as we go along, some of these methods are really helpful for you, while others may not quite fit. And that's perfectly normal, and it's perfectly all right to stick with a method that's working for you and ignore my other suggestions. So let's begin. <laughs> 